cold hard truth is that if you're going to court alone and the other side has a lawyer, you're at a serious disadvantage. Statistics show that the odds are stacked against you and the side with the attorney has a better chance of winning. What can you do to improve your chances and even up the odds? Let's discuss it. Hi, I'm Larry DiMarco and I'm a family law, personal injury and workers' compensation attorney. The best way to improve your chances in court is to prepare. First, learn the law that applies to your fact pattern. Your, face, your first place to look for help for information about the law is the court itself. Many courts have people, either paid or volunteer, whose job it is to provide free information to people who don't have lawyers. They'll help you with what papers to file, where you got to file them, how many copies, and where to send them, things like that. So first, check with the court clerk's office. Almost every county in the state and country has this information online. So in a search browser, Google or so, you can find it by typing in family court, quote unquote, your state and county. Once you get to the website, look for anything that says self-help, pro se help, self-representation. Pro se means self-represented. The website will direct you to places like desk, hotline, center, service, office, or a similar place or location. Save, bookmark, and download, link, and record contact information as you're searching. So you don't have to go back and research for the same information. When you call, you will ask them for what you need to file and how to comply with legal procedure. You can also ask for a referral to any other places, resources, information, and independent services such as volunteers, nonprofits, law schools, bar associations, or other resources. Before you call, look for forms, instruction sheets, rules, and other information on that court website that can help you. There should be a lot of information on the website about what the judges and hearing officers expect from you, and it can also, pri it, it can also provide private links to places where you can get more help and information. In addition to the court website, you can find good stuff online separately. There's a gold mine of information called, well, on the website, lawhelp.org, a website that's run by a nonprofit organization to help you get free information online. Go to that site, go to that site, and once you're there, click on your state, or of course, just type in the initials of your state, for instance, my state, PA, lawhelp.org. This website indexes and organizes a lot of the information you need. And the, investigate, read, and review what's online before you call any self-help desk. That way, when you call, you can be asking for clarification about what you read online and didn't understand, rather than have a phone help person just direct you to documents that you could have found on your own. As I mentioned before in other videos, the only people who can help give legal advice are attorneys, a private attorney. All people in the self-help information desks at, at the courthouse or online or on the phone can only provide general information, not strategy or guidance on your personal issue. For that type of help, you need a lawyer. In preparing your case, ask yourself three questions. One, what do I want the judge to order? Two, why should the judge give it to me? And three, how, I, how am I going to prove that I'm entitled to it? So the analysis is what, why, and how. First, let's consider the what. Let's say you filed a petition for partial custody because you want to see your child more. Consider exactly what you want the judge to order and write it out in a short, clear statement specifically what you're going to request in, ter in, in terms of day, time, or weekly schedule. Everything and anything you prepare relating to the why and the how, the second T 
two parts after you do this should relate back and support that what that you're asking for. Suppose you only have every other weekend and one night every other week and you want 50-50. Or the other parent won't let you see your child and uses bad excuses to give you less and less time and deny you access. So for more time, you write every weekend, Friday after work to Monday morning before school. And summers at my house and the other parent gets every other weekend during that summer. So that's the what. And the why and how will be drafted in support of that agenda. Don't waste time on arguing about or thinking about things that aren't related to your what. For instance, if you want every weekend and your ex only wants you to have every other weekend, you're not going to bring up that your ex cheated on you when you both were married or the ex gets drunk and goes out dancing and partying until 2 a.m. on the weekends when that person doesn't have a child. It's irrelevant, distracting, and the judge doesn't care. You're only going to discuss why your home is a good place to be every weekend and during the summer. Going to family court isn't like negotiating the price of a car where the dealer makes up the price and you lowball and the two sides then split the difference or compromise at the end. It's more like baseball arbitration where each side submits their best reasonable proposal and the judge picks one or the other. If you're unreasonable and your ex is reasonable, you're much more likely to lose. If you come in with something realistic, you're more likely to get what you want. Now let's discuss the why. This is more involved. The why are the reasons you'll give when you try to persuade someone that you should get what you want. It's your, expl your explanation of why you're reasonable. For instance, let's go back to that other example of you trying to get every weekend rather than every other weekend. So in that example, suppose you work a full 40 or 50 hour week from Monday to Friday and your weekends are free and your ex has the child five days a week and is only working part time. So in your proposal, the child will have equally quality time with both parents, even factoring in those work uh, schedules. When preparing the why, just list the simple reasons without going into detail about the evidence or testimony. That's the next part, the how. After you're confident on what you're asking for and with the reasons that you'll give for the why you should get it, then you plan and prepare that third step, the how. Write out, gather, and organize how you're going to present your case. The relevant evidence, text messages, pictures, emails, stories, testimony, and witnesses you'll bring into court with you to testify that's in the child's best interest for you to get what you want. Include everything that supports your position. Forget how awful the other parent treats you. Focus on the evidence that supports what you want. Judges don't want to waste a lot of time hearing about how bad people are. They're usually persuaded by the positive. Be as detailed as you can and in describing the testimony that you'll personally give and what arguments you'll make. After you've written everything out, put down your notes and all the work for a few days. Cool off and take another look, especially if you're feeling strong uh, emotion or passion while you were preparing that document and allow a cooling off period before memorizing and rehearsing anything that you want to say in court. Discuss your ideas with your support network, parents, best friends, therapist or counselor or other trusted source. It's also good to get a consultation from a lawyer or some trusted advisor so you have another person, another perspective outside your own. After you're confident in what you want to say, Practice out loud and rehearse as if you're in the hearing room itself. Do it enough until you can talk naturally and not like you're reading a book. Ideally, you want to appear like you're conversing and only checking your notes out once in a while to be sure that you've covered anything. So in summary, we've got a three-step process organizing the what, 
the why, and the how. Draft and write notes down in support of each. After you've done that, wait and then review. Do this with someone else and revise and practice. If you do all that, you'll show that you care enough to prepare and you'll stand out. You'll have a better chance at a good result. Mark Twain famously wrote, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. He means that it takes more effort to put thought into a topic, organize your thoughts, and be efficient than it does just to ramble on without focus and organization. Keep that concept in mind when you prepare your argument and remember judges, especially family court judges, are swamped, so you'll score points by being brief. The way to keep your argument short is to write out what you want to say first and then review it afterwards. For each sentence that you wrote out and want to include, ask yourself, does it help me win? And how? And if you can't answer that question, then you don't need that statement. Take it out. When you have a court case open, have an elevator pitch. I uh, ran for office. And as a political candidate, I was taught that you must be able to summarize your campaign within 17 seconds and get the person to vote for you before the voter gets off a short elevator ride. Simple, to the point. Just, to give, just give a general understanding of the overall pi uh, picture and you can fill in the details later. But once you've said your pitch, even a stranger can spread the word about you or restate what you're about. So it's important for you to have a brief pitch for the opening statement that you're going to give a trial, any brief closing argument, the intro and conclusion for a memo that you're writing, or just a quick summary for a settlement conference officer. It's that brief few lines that you give when a friend asks, hey, what's going on? What's that case that you have about? They don't want you to talk their ear off. They just want the short version, but it's got to have the essence of what's going on. It's not easy to do briefly, but once you nail it, it's great to have. If you have something longer than that 17 seconds or so, maybe more like 40 seconds, here's how you shorten it down. Just like we discussed in another video when we were discussing the preparation for a hearing, the what, why, and how, we'll take the, the what and the why. So ask what you want done in court and why it should be done and write it down. After you've done that, chop it up and then skim it down to the bare minimum amount of words. Then practice. Say it out loud until you don't feel stupid. Practice, modify, and revise until you can give that statement to your coffee buddy or a colleague in an elevator. A family law case involves at least two people and more if there's children. The judge knows this and so should you. Even if you're the reasonable one and your ex is busting your chops the whole way, you still chose that person as a spouse or co-parent or at least didn't run away sooner after the warning signs were there. Making the story all about you will hurt you. Anticipate that the judge will hear from your ex, so prepare for that side of the story it can only help you. Ask yourself the same question that I ask every client that comes into my office. What will your ex say about you to help him or her in the courtroom? Answer that question and write it down. Make a list and have a plan to deal with everything, especially the bad and embarrassing stuff. Many people have a victim mentality. Woe is me. Look at what my ex is doing to me. What a monster he or she is. The attitude doesn't work. Judges know that no matter how convincing one side is, the other side is going to say something else very different, and don't pretend to assume that the judge is going to agree with you. The judge tries to see through both sides and figure out what happened. Acknowledge the other side's position and discuss why you're more reasonable. Point out where your ex is inaccurate, exaggerates, or takes things out of context. But always be civil and respectful to your ex, even when you argue there's a misrepresentation. Don't 
ever say someone's lying or evil. You look bad when you do that. Let the judge make that conclusion. It's not for you to say. By acknowledging the other side during your turn, you'll reduce the negative impact and dramatic effect of the opposing argument. It can be dangerous to ignore your ex's best material and just let it come out first in the manner that they want. You control the story. You control the, narr the narrative. Get the negative stuff that you know will come out out on your own terms. Don't just tell the judge that you are right and that your ex is wrong. Show it. Prove it. Give the judge the reasons to see your side of the story when you lay out your evidence. That's the how of the preparation that I discussed in an earlier video. A judge needs to base a decision on facts and evidence. It's just not the passion or the persuasiveness of your voice, how nice you ask, or how charming you can be. It's in the evidence, the testimony, the witnesses, your exhibits, and how you back up what you're saying. When you're trying to persuade the judge, mention your evidence, the facts that support you. When giving your argument, tell your side of the story from the perspective of your child. Show the judge that you consider your child's point of view at all times. For example, let's say that your ex is withholding your child when you promised to take your son or daughter to an amusement park and it was something scheduled. So because she withheld, uh, he or she withheld your child from you, you file a contempt petition. You could say that your ex is being spiteful or selfish and trying to punish you for something and that you might be so, that might be true. But that type of argument is only about you and not your child. It's much more powerful to refrain the situation from your child's perspective. You can tell the judge that it's heartbreaking for you to disappoint your child when you make every effort to set a reliable example and you're trying to teach responsibility. You can explain how upset he or she gets when you don't get to see each other. You don't disparage, criticize, or speculate about the ex's behavior. The story isn't about the parents. It's about your child, the bond that you're trying to build, and why you're concerned that the custody order isn't followed. Focus on enforcing the order, not just because you want things convenient for you, but because you're focusing on the best interests of the child. Then your ex has to explain why the custody order wasn't followed and the issue isn't about the two of you bickering, it's about the child. So, the, uh, so your argument's more powerful and effective. It might take time and effort, but it's worth it. Exhibits should be used to support important things that you need to prove. They also can be used to contradict things that your ex would like the judge to believe, but it's false or inaccurate. Before you even begin preparing for your case, search your email account under your ex's address. Look at the review, the notes in your calendars of the custody exchanges or not, or any events that you've recorded. Review the text messages between the two of you, you and your ex, pictures on your phone, Save voicemail messages and any other video recordings that you have that you think that can help you. Using exhibits effectively will show the judge that you take the matter seriously and will make it easier for the judge to take you seriously as well. When you're in court, it's not enough just to have the information. You can't just tell the judge something's a fact because you know it. You have to prove it. And you prove it by providing it and showing the evidence itself. The only evidence the judge consider is the testimony and the documents that you hand up to him or her. That means to be able to do that, you have to know where to find it in your box, notebook, folder, or briefcase. And then when you want to present it, you have to share copies with your ex or your ex's lawyer, a copy for the judge, and a copy for the clerk. To stay organized, 
keep a table of contents and clearly mark all the exhibits that you're prepared to hand up so you'll have no trouble finding it in the heat of battle when you have that nervous adrenaline rush in court. On the other hand, if you show up in court with your exhibits randomly stacked in a pile, you'll risk wasting the court's time fumbling around to find what you need. The judge might decide that if you don't care enough about your case to keep things organized, then you probably don't care about what the judge is going to decide either. Or the judge might not give you the time to find what you need, no matter how important it was, so keep it handy. Put the same consideration in the case that you expect from the judge. So let's discuss some ways or an example on uh, how to use an exhibit. For instance, a support case. Don't just say how much you spend per month on expenses when you know the other side is disputing what you're saying. Prepare a, your credit card statement or bank statements as proof to support what you're saying. Whenever there's a document that will prove what you're saying is correct, Get a copy, get several copies of it, and enter it into evidence after you talk about it. If your ex is saying that he or she is earning much less than he or she did before, show a pay stub that you had when you were married that, you, that, you, uh, that your ex had showed you before that you kept a copy of. If your ex says that she, he or she doesn't have the ability to get anything but a minimum wage job, Show the resume, which shows the graduate school education and high-paying job experience. Keep a list of what's in evidence and what each exhibit can prove. So when it's time to make an argument and persuade the judge, you have a list of the exhibits with a proper identifying name and an explanation of what you think that exhibit shows so you can refer to it during your argument and use it to persuade the judge. I just appreciate it when you take the time and effort to show and explain uh, the documents that support what you're saying so you give them a reason to find in your favor with confidence without having to just take your word for what you're requesting. Anything that you want to show the judge or anything that will make it more likely that you're telling the truth should be submitted into evidence and vice versa. If something that you have will contradict something that the other side is saying, have that and use it on cross-examination or questioning or just submit it into evidence. When you have documents and exhibits prepared, organized, copied, and indexed into a table of contents, then you'll know you're ready to go. The other side's there at court to present evidence against you. It's an adversarial system. They're going to ask for something different than what you want. However polite or even friendly the other side is outside of court, remember that when your case is called, they're going to be telling the judge why you shouldn't get what you want. You're in litigation. I say this because I want you to protect yourself in court and not get blindsided. Now, having said that, even though we have an adversarial system, you should always be civil and courteous with your ex, your ex's family, and your ex's friends. It looks childish to ignore that they're there or refuse to say hello. Your best bet is to always act civil, polite, and acknowledge the other person without being rude or offensive while keeping a polite distance. Generally, it's not a good idea to get into conversation with the other side or any of their supporters, even when you know them. The danger is that you'll end up in an argument or become upset that they're not on your side. You, you want to go into court calm and focused instead of agitated and upset over a discussion in the waiting room. Now let's talk about your supporters, your support network. Just because someone loves you and supports you doesn't mean they're necessarily helpful. Friends and family are beside you because they want to help. However, they can be so busy telling you what you want to hear that it's difficult for you to see your case clearly or objectively. The judge is impartial, so it'll hurt your case if you can't be reasonable and objective too. Some supporters feel that it's their job to tell you how right you always are and how wrong or terrible your ex is. Many supporters think they're letting you down if they don't encourage you to keep fighting and never give up. However, more often than not, 
This never say die attitude can keep you from considering good compromises and good settlement proposals. Don't ever feel that compromising or working with your ex means that you're letting your friends or family down and giving up. A reasonable settlement outside of court is usually a lot better than having a judge decide your, decide your future for you and your family. You need to be focused and not agitated while you're preparing for your case. A friend's not a friend if they only rile you up with hate or anger. A good calm supporters tell you to remain calm, focus on what's important to you, and don't sweat the small stuff. Friends help friends solve problems, see the painful truth, and help you make hard choices. If your supporters aren't helpful in that way, then don't discuss your case with them and don't bring them to court. You're being watched in court, dressed to impress. Respect the court by putting your best foot forward like you care what the judge thinks of you. Wear something that would fit in an office setting around an older, conservative group. Dress like you're going to a fancy restaurant, maybe Sunday church, or some other proper event. Wear clean, tucked in clothes. No torn jeans, t-shirts, or sweatshirts with lettering or quotes across your chest. I'm not saying wear a tux or suit, but look nice. Don't dress in skin tight, risque, over sexy, short shorts or mini skirts for girls, and for guys, muscle shirts or tank tops. No workout clothes, team jerseys, gang symbols, or other loud clothes, that sort of thing. Tone down any spiked hair, super loud hairdo, large, huge jewelry, and remove any body or facial piercings that you wouldn't see in a courtroom on TV. Assume that you have an old stuffy judge who has old-fashioned conservative opinions about the way people should look. If you're just in work clothes because you've just come from work, tell that to the judge. When you first introduce yourself, apologize for your clothes and appearance and explain that you just come from a work site and you didn't have time to change. If you have no better clothes because you're out of the home and your ex won't let you get your things, tell it to the judge. Don't get into an argument with the ex, just explain your situation and the judge will say, oh, that's quite all right, it doesn't matter, and will appreciate that you thought to, brought it up, to bring it up. Acting mannerly and polite is just as important as how you look. Don't chew gum, slouch, or mumble. Stand up straight. No slang, hip phrases, or expressions. Refer to the judge as Judge Doe Smith or Your Honor only. No other, no, no over-familiar language. Assume that the judge isn't hip, doesn't know trends, doesn't understand street talk, slang, or even want it in the courtroom. When diplomats or foreign uh, emissaries from countries go to other countries, they learn the language of the place where they go. When you're on the street, you can talk like the homies, but when you're in court, drop the slang and talk straight. The odds are that the judge will be older than you and might not understand the hip clothes, culture, or language. Don't show anger, frustration, impatience, or raise your voice. Control your emotions, including excessive crying or bawling. Showing discipline is better than letting that raw, unrestrained emotion pour out. You'll still be able to show that you care just by being genuine and authentic. There's no need for drama. Always be calm, cool, collected, and polite to your ex, her friends, family, new significant other, and lawyer. Hold doors, show your manners, never be rude. You're, be wa you're being watched the entire time, and often court clerks or other staff will let a judge know when they see misbehavior or someone making a scene in a waiting room. When your ex or opposing witness is testifying, look at them. Listen and pay attention. Don't roll your eyes, shake your head, mutter, or make sounds and interrupt. You're not supposed to, even when the witness testimony is outrageous. 
There's differences. Body language makes a difference in the debate between Al Gore and George W. Bush as well. Gore sighs over and over again. And Bush, the underdog, surprises by winning the debate and, of course, the election. That's what a governor... Judges will pick up on these side little things, give the appearance of being thoughtful, calm, cool, and collected, even when someone's saying nasty, outrageous things about you. And I know that sounds easier than it actually is. Call the other side by first name and don't make sarcastic, nasty, or childish comments ever. Always show class. You want to show the judge that you're a reasonable, under control, and patient person. And please note how important these qualities are in being a good parent. So when you're showing class in court, you're demonstrating that you're a good parent and calm under stress. If you act reasonable, the judge is more likely to think your request in court is reasonable. You might bring friends or family along for moral support. And there's an expression, guilt by association. Friends and family are an extension of you. The people you bring to court contribute to the judge's opinion of you. Your friends and witnesses need to follow these same suggestions about appearance, manners, and behavior. If you're looking and acting classy and appropriately, but your friends are carrying on, you'll look like you're putting on an act and a phony. So in summary, appearance and behavior matter. How you look and act is gonna contribute to the judge's opinion of you and factor in the ultimate decision. My wife uses the phrase, poke the beast. When I'm in a bad mood and holding back my rage, my son starts to needle me until my wife says to him, Thomas, don't poke the beast. You know your ex will try to do this to you in court, before court, probably all the time. But if you refuse to overreact and keep control, you can, take, you can turn the tables on your ex. So how do we control our anger? I'm gonna tell you how. I'm gonna give you a powerful image that you can think about anytime your ex pushes your buttons or gets you off your game, causing you to do something impulsive that you'll later regret. Think carefully of a time when you wanna blow your stack and then I want you to do like this guy does that I'm about to show you. Do this in your mind. Oh, that wasn't a bit nice. You have made me very angry. Very angry indeed. So, during that time of near rage, think of Marvin the Martian. And if that doesn't work, find an image that works for you. Because Marvin the Martian works for me. You see that adrenaline rush that you get when someone presses your button? It's a neurological response that lasts less than two seconds. After that, you actually make a choice to stay angry. So when the buttons are pressed, immediately distract yourself by thinking of Marvin the Martian or whatever works for you to get back on your game. Your ex has tried to press your button and you haven't reacted. It's now time to defuse this situation. Definitely. Don't try to think of a quick, witty, sarcastic, or clever retort that retaliates in court. That type of, well, aggressive response makes you look petty, childish, and weak. Don't engage or perpetuate uh, the situation by trying to push your ex's buttons back. You win the skirmish in court if you face aggression and respond calmly. You lose if you try to make someone else look angry, even if it works. Silly games always backfire in court. When your ex and your ex's friends glare at you or say what they know will get you worked up, ignore them. When you resist after someone tries to push your buttons, the other side gets upset. Doing nothing is the most powerful thing you can do. If you respond, <coughs> excuse me, if you respond, the other side wins. Your silence will have a stronger impact than any response you can give because they'll wonder where you gain the strength and poise to break the pattern of allowing your buttons to be pushed in the first place. And the true winner is the child because you refused to engage and let a situation deteriorate into 
a petty argument. Keep calm, cool, diffuse the situation, and disengage. Never hate your enemies. It affects your judgment. Never let anyone know what you're thinking. Never hate your enemies. It clouds your judgment. And never let anyone know what you're thinking. Two wise sentences from Michael Corleone to his nephew from Godfather 3. And unfortunately, this has deep, close application to family court, I'm sad to say. And I'd like to discuss what I mean. Hi, I'm Larry DeMarco. I'm a family law, personal injury, and workers' compensation attorney. The family law court system puts father and mother against each other in a legal war. And parents often try to completely destroy the co-parent because of the leftover pain, raw emotion, and deep wounds that were inflicted from the relationship or the breakup. Ideally, parents would support each other for the benefit of their child or children, but the reality is that the pain and the emotion from the breakup can be so intense that it causes aggressive, irrational behavior and destruction to one or both parents. In that type of high-conflict litigation in family court, every decision you make will either help or hurt you, or be neutral. Your job is to make sure that whatever you do helps you at all times. This means you need to stop and think before you act impulsively. If you send a text or email, will it be used against you in court? If you say something over the phone, will it be repeated? If you throw a tantrum, will it be videoed? Going into court requires thinking clearly and making good choices. Every time before you write, speak, or act, you should consider how it affects your court case. It means that you need to have a clear mind and shouldn't let emotion cloud your judgment. The emotion related or that comes with a divorce or breakup, parenting, and sharing children with someone who you have intense pain from is some of the most intense, extreme, and blinding influence which causes impulsive, irrational, and self-destructive behavior. It'll take patience, discipline, and restraint to always think clearly and not act impulsively. That might mean letting the other side getting away with insulting you, busting your chops, or deliberately inconveniencing you. It often means turning the other cheek, and swallowing pride for the benefit of your children and your family. I know this is easier said than done, but it's necessary if you want to put your best, forward, your best foot forward in court. The second part of the Godfather's advice is, never let anyone know what you're thinking, ever. The reason why is simple. When someone else knows what's in your mind and what you're thinking and feeling, then they know how to make you angry and emotional. And when you're angry and emotional, they can manipulate you, get you to act impulsively, and make you look bad. And this enables them to control you and beat you in court. Your ex wants, to make, wants you to make hasty, emotional, and bad decisions and they want you to, and they will do and say things to provoke you into losing control. When you respond with hate and anger, you're giving in to your, your enemy and, to, and you're giving ammunition for your enemy to use against you. And I use the word enemy usually in this analogy and it should not be an enemy, it's a co-parent. But acknowledge this. Acknowledge the, the bad influence of, of hate and negative emotion. Accept it and guard against it. Every bad emotional decision will give your ex evidence against you. And you don't want to spend your precious short time in court defending bad decisions and actions that you made because you acted with hate, anger, and impulse. You want to be talking in court about 
only your good parenting. So remember the Godfather. Don't hate, don't hate your co-parent, your enemies. The emotion clouds your judgment. And don't let your co-parent know what you're thinking so that you can be manipulated into angry, emotional behavior. Don't engage. Act like a co-parent at all times. And again, I understand that that's easier said than done. And it takes discipline, focus, and uh, concentration. If you're a self-rep, you've already realized you can't afford to hire a lawyer to take on your case, or you don't want one. Pick the brain of someone who's already been there alone and made it out, and made it out okay. Maybe you know someone who's already been to family court. Invite them to dinner, happy hour, or coffee, to, and get them to talk about their experience. Ask what they did to prepare, what they do differently, what worked, and what didn't. Ask for advice. See what you can learn from their experiences. If your work schedule allows, go to the courtroom ahead of time to scout out the scene. Just even find the courtroom, the courthouse, the right floor, the right place, so that you're, so you aren't going to a strange place for the first time. You know you won't get lost and it'll reduce the overall anxiety. Another source to consider, do you know anyone who makes presentations at work or who does public speaking for a living? Speak to them about how to project your voice, use body language, and develop uh, techniques to present an argument in a more persuasive manner. If you don't have a professional to give you advice, still ask a friend to play the role of a judge and give the presentation to him or her. Role play. Uh, practice your elevator pitch. That's that 17 second summary that we discuss in the video called Keeping It Brief. Uh, practice your opening, a brief closing. Practice speaking in public, looking others in the eye when you talk. Ask your friend to interrupt you with questions and then you can practice answering the question and returning to your organized presentation. If you don't have a friend that you can do that with, then practice alone in front of a mirror or with a cell phone. Video your presentation, play it back, so you can review and critique how you look and sound. I warn you, that can be pretty painful to do, even for a professional, so don't get discouraged when you look like an idiot. The purpose is to help you get better. Don't get down. Seriously, it doesn't matter how or where you rehearse. So long as you practice, and improve your presentation, you're not going to feel like a deer in headlights It's your day in court and it'll help you think on your feet. A warning about having unrealistic expectations about what will happen in court. Careful it can cost you. Most people who represent themselves tend to be overly optimistic and possibly lose their, ob their objectivity and have overly high expectations. What we lawyers do is help our clients understand how a judge will see the situation and will make sure that the client has realistic expectations about what the results will be. Without a lawyer, you don't have the opportunity to hear how strong or weak your case is or how strong or weak the other side case is. You don't know what parts of your case to emphasize and what parts of the other party's case you need to rebut. And you don't know how a judge who, uh, how a judge was faced with similar situations and reacted in the past. Thinking that you can end up getting more than what's realistic can cause you to miss a fair and good settlement offer and possibly increase the chances that you'll lose more than what's necessary. Going to court with these unreasonable expectations and demands can make the judge think you're unreliable. And if you seem unreliable, and if the other side comes across as looking reasonable, the judge is more likely to find for the other side. The smartest thing that you can do when acting for yourself is to invest some money into your success by getting some focused legal advice. The better you understand your position, the better you'll know what to expect and how to handle the case. And then, the better chance you'll have in getting through it successfully. The internet 
Cell phones and social media have collectively created a giant online database consisting of written journals, pictures of social occasions, and home videos which give details of our daily activities, our night trips out, our vacations, and other outings. All this information is neatly organized by date, time, and place. These online journals give details of our work, family, recreation, daily routines, accomplishments, and emotions. The information is public, and even if you try to keep it private, a good opposing lawyer can access this information sometimes. And this giant online database serves as future evidence and exhibits to be used against us in court to give relevant evidence in almost any lawsuit to our opponents. For instance, in personal injury and workers' compensation, our social media accounts can display a picture of complete health when, on the contrary, we're still feeling pain. In divorce and custody court, we can unknowingly expose intimate secrets when we want to protect our privacy in a divorce case or custody. The biggest irony is that we do this to ourselves every time we type on a keyboard or take a selfie with our cell phone and post it in our social media accounts. We give our opponents the ammunition to be used against us. These journals are never erased and they're permanent. I've got to emphasize just how damaging this online stuff is because it often contradicts our testimony in dramatic fashion with our own statements and images. We create these social media journals because we want to remember special times, events, and experiences, and we crave connection with each other. So what can we do to protect ourselves in court? When we post in line, ask yourself, do I want the whole world or at least my opponent to know what I'm posting? If not, don't post it. What if stuff is already up and it's time to testify? Before you testify, review your account and journals and use it as a reminder of what you've done and where you've been. Assume your, assume your social media account will be used against you. My experience with my clients is that when they testify about their injuries and disability, the emotion and trauma from the pain causes them to dramatize and use extreme language in describing the effect from the injury. So there can be a wide difference between the reality of the journal and the description and the testimony of that injury. Especially because you give the testimony often months later than the events, month, months or years later than actually what you're describing. So as a witness, you don't want to create an appearance that you're lying. Because if anything's different or extremely different, a judge and jury will assume that you're lying, even if you're just honestly remembering something different. This will cost you money. Lots of money. So the solution, be aware that when you post on social media, the information that you're posting is going out to the world and opponents in litigation, not just friends and family. This can happen even if you have a restricted or private account. Remember, you don't have to be the one doing the posting. Other people can take pictures of you and tag you on Facebook. So there might be something public out there you don't want seen, even if you're not active on your account. Review your social media before you testify and don't contradict what's out there. Getting out of a marriage is harder than getting in. Getting engaged and married can be easy. Just fill out some simple forms pay a fee, and get a judge or minister to marry you. Getting out of a marriage was made deliberately hard by lawmakers as a matter of public policy. Society generally wanted married couples to stay together and work things out. So as deterrent, they added waiting periods to hope that people calm down and work stuff out. And the courts set up all the procedure, paperwork, and documents to file to be confusing and difficult to navigate. The legal divorce forms are highly specific, the procedure is strict, and there are many rules and guidelines you need to follow in order to get through. As a result, it's worth getting professional help to process the paperwork, but you don't necessarily need that help to be from an attorney or law firm. When you and your ex generally agree, and you're not hostile, and don't have a lot of money, assets, or children, then no, I don't think you need a lawyer to fill out this divorce paperwork. You see, our court system is adversarial in nature, 
And lawyers have an ethical requirement and are professionally responsible to be zealous advocates for one client against the opponent, which is the ex, the other spouse or parent. So while, so while it's in your best interest to leave a relationship peacefully, mend fences, and heal broken hearts, not burn bridges, the lawyer's obligation is to think of all the different ways one spouse can screw over the other. Lawyers are trained to fight, take an adversarial position, be sharks or pit bulls, and win. What's worse, they're paid by the hour, so the financial incentive for the lawyer is to have long, drawn-out conflict and that's often not what the client wants, which is short and sweet. The more issues lawyers raise, the more money they make. If one spouse wins and the other is screwed, then the lawyer is considered high quality. What's bad is that having ex-spouses screw each other isn't good for society at large, and it hurts families. Going back to the original scenario, when a divorcing couple or separating parents both, deg both agree and don't want to hurt each other, I recommend finding a legal service or other organization to process the divorce papers for you, not a lawyer or law firm. There's a bunch of services that'll do this for you in no particular order, Legal Zoom, Rocket Lawyer, Legal Shield, or just type in uh, a search browser on the internet, quote unquote, uncontested divorce, and put in your state and contact that service. They'll draft all the paperwork, and it's the same documents that lawyers draft, but at a much lower cost because they handle volume and only handle agreements. Agreement is cheap. Fighting is enormously expensive. I'm not proposing that you never speak to a lawyer. On the contrary, you need to know your legal rights, and you might, otherwise, you might be giving up too much. Neither party should do that. Each of you, each parent and each divorced party should get a legal consultation from a lawyer, ask questions, write down the answers and find out where you stand, what your rights are. If you and your ex disagree but aren't blinded by emotion or an uncontrollable desire to inflict pain, resolve the differences with a mediator in a conference room, not lawyers in court. Keep peace. Don't let things deteriorate into war. Stay on the same page and compromise. If you can't compromise, a mediator can help you. They're trained in conflict resolution. A lot of people fight, not necessarily because of irreconcilable differences, but because people don't know how to communicate and work through differences. Mediators are trained in conflict re re uh, resolution. To do just that can help you communicate and work through your differences. And if you need some incentive to play nice, remember this. If you want to fight in a divorce, your average cost in America is between $25,000 and $50,000 per party. The cost for an uncontested divorce is a few hundred dollars. So in summary, yes. Talk to a lawyer, find out where you stand. But to process the paperwork, use one of those budget services. Price compare. Search the internet and look and what the cost of an uncontested divorce can be. Your county court will have other charges and filing fees for the divorce, so don't think that that's the only cost, but it will be the only professional fee or lawyer's fee. This is dirt cheap compared to the legal fees for a private lawyer who's representing you in a conflict or contested matter. I kid you not. It's the same in custody as it is for a divorce. When parents fight, things can get just as expensive uh, as legal fees for divorce and also can reach that $25,000 per parent for each petition easily. Mediate if you can. Don't litigate. For the people who want to agree but have an angry ex who won't stop fighting, you'll have to go the long way, either by getting a lawyer or by handling as much of the legal work yourself as you can. And I have a lot of information on my YouTube channel to help you do as much of your own work.